Hello and welcome to the Majlis podcast, Ready for Pride Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Ready for Pride Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. The discussion about uh, Turkmen gas flowing to Europe has always been a dream for Ashgabat, a dream that is crucial for Turkmenistan's ability to diversify its gas export and for Europe to diversify its gas import. It's a discussion that began shortly after the independence of Turkmenistan, despite the fact that Turkmenistan has planned Plenty of gas in Europe is in need of gas. The project never even got closer to realization. Now, there is a new American company that has devised a plan to the decades-old puzzle of how to transport the Turkmen gas across the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan and potentially onward to Europe. On today's Majlis podcast, we are honored to have two important figures leading this project. They are Ambassador Alan Mustard, former U.S. Ambassador to Turkmenistan, John Roberts, a renowned expert on energy resources around the Caspian Sea. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Lokan Cesci, Chair of the Central Asia Studies at the Glasgow University, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free the Liberties, Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us today uh, in this important conversation. I guess today we have two main topics to explore. One is obviously the new plan around the Trans-Caspian Pipeline, what is in it, how it differs from what's being uh, discussed so far, and issues around lingering feasibility questions. And also, if we had time towards the end of the conversation, I also like to hear uh, thoughts about the recent discussions around the TAPI, since we have so many energy experts today. And why I say that, there was a discussions going on between the Taliban representatives in Turkmenistan talking about the TAPI project um, in recent uh, days. So uh, with that, why not to start from the new plan from uh, Ambassador Mustard? So tell us about the, the main points of the, the plan that your team is putting up around the Caspian pipeline. The major difference between this project and uh, previous concepts is that it is much more modest. In the past, the, the concept was 30 billion cubic meters of gas per year that would come out of the Galkanish gas field, be shipped across Turkmenistan in the east-west pipeline, which was completed in December 2015, and then go through a yet-to-be-constructed Trans-Caspian pipeline undersea to uh, Azerbaijan, and there would go into the uh, Southern Gas Corridor. And there are a couple of problems with that. Number one is that there would have to be a tremendous amount of upstream investment in the Galkanish gas field to produce an additional 30 billion cubic meters of gas to feed into that. Uh, the second big problem is that the Trans-Caspian pipeline would cost about $8 billion, we estimate. And given the state of the hydrocarbon industry right now, and the fact that, that customers are shifting towards renewables, uh, there just isn't the kind of financing available at this point that there was 10 years ago, even five years ago, for large-scale projects like that. Uh, there actually is a third problem, which is that the Southern Gas Corridor does not have the capacity right now to accommodate another 30 billion cubic meters of, uh, per year of gas. That would require additional downstream investment also a large figure. Maybe John Roberts can give us an idea of how much that would be. So taking all of this into uh, account, uh, what this project envisions is a small pipeline, 10 to 12 billion cubic meters of capacity that would connect two platforms in the Caspian Sea and take gas that is produced from existing wells, put it through otherwise existing infrastructure aside from approximately a 78 kilometer pipeline that would have to be built and leverage existing assets. We think this could be done for about a, between a half a billion dollars and maybe uh, uh, three quarters of a, of a billion, uh, something uh, of, of that magnitude a much smaller investment to leverage existing assets and take gas that is currently either being flared or is simply being released to the atmosphere as methane and put it to productive use. Okay, very insightful. I guess John just dropped out and I'm trying to bring him back. Certainly, we would like to hear what he has to say about this. Okay, John is back. So, John, uh, the plan that we are talking about, is there any additional thoughts that you would like to add in addition to what the, what we heard from Master Mustard about this? I think there's one key thing which was referred to by the ambassador, which is that the Southern Gas Corridor is predicated on a maximum of 20 BCM going to Turkey and 30 or so going 
onwards to Europe in total capacity. Now, of that, half is already taken. So that leaves an extra 16 BCM that you can get into Turkey. The problem is that it's not the infrastructure through Georgia and the southern range of the South Caucasus Mountains to carry that gas. So you've got to build another extensive set of pipeline infrastructure there. And you've also got to considerably expand the infrastructure within Turkey and, of course, beyond Turkey to Europe if you're going to take anything like the 30 BCM that was originally envisaged when the Turkmen's and the EU were discussing this kind of project in the 2000s. What can be done is a modest amount of gas flowing through Azerbaijan via the proposed connector and utilising existing capacities. That probably is not going to be more than 2 or 3 BCM as far as Turkey, but at least that's 2 or 3 BCM available to be sent to a hard cash customer, and that's not to be sneezed at. And the whole point is... A project of our scale, one that is essentially confined on our part to the construction of a 78 kilometers pipeline, is enormously cheaper than anything else. Okay. I, I hear you, John, and also Ambassador, that it is way modest than what we have been talking about so far in terms of the Trans-Caspian pipeline or any gas reaching from Turkmenistan to European market. So on the other end of Europe, uh, Dr. Luka and Chesti, you are also looking into these discussions. You have been looking into these discussion since it started in the early days of Turkmenistan's independence. So what we heard from our colleagues there in terms of this new plan, are you excited that finally this happening well, excited is always a big word for me muhammad but okay. but i would say that uh, they captured my interest in the ways that the approach that they have just outlined the ambassador john roberts it's especially interestingly new it's not just putting something out for the sake of doing it, it seems that not only they've done the homework but not, but also that they've realized that there have been different approaches of pretty much the same way of thinking in the last 30 years and none of them has worked because Turkmen gas does not flow westwards yet so at least the fact that that this company has thought of a new way an easier way to connect cross caspian trans caspian gas in the mean in the sense that they can join this two platform in the Turkmen sector and in the Azeri sector, it's it's a step in the right direction. As is the fact that we are not talking about the gas that has to be drilled, but this is just flaring, which is environmentally better than what the, the structure would be. So I think that, of course, we would like to see how this develops. I, I wish them all the best, but there are, of course, wider issues, especially what kind of energy policy can Turkmenistan pursue in, in the longer term. But we will see whether or not this is the beginning of something else. Although, uh, and I appreciate in both my predecessor, the, the, the ambassador and John mentioned before, is a policy of the, of the small steps. Mm. We start with a small step and we'll see what happens what happen later on. Okay. Bruce, I also need help from both uh, you and uh, Dr. Luca to help to read our, our expert's brain on this. Uh, please feel free to ask any question that you might have in terms of the details of the projects that we have heard so far. Bruce, other than that, so how do you see all this discussion? Well, I, all right, I'll make a comment real quick because I do have a question. What I'm amazed at at this, and I don't know if, if you guys have a crystal ball or something like that that you've been looking into, but, but like so many things seem to have fallen in place for a project like this just in recent weeks. You know, I, at, at work, I have a Russian news wire that runs all the time on my computer, and they've been gleefully reporting that the price of a thousand cubic meters of gas in Europe is well up over eleven eleven hundred dollars these days. So, you know, all of a sudden the search for new sources of gas is, is a serious issue in Europe at the moment. You know, also the fact that, that Turkey is, is a much stronger player. It made some progress in Central Asia, but certainly a lot of progress in Azerbaijan recently and on the global stage more generally. Plus, we had the reports also about Turkmen methane releases and how bad that they were right behind the U.S. and Russia in terms of methane releases into the atmosphere and what damage that was causing. So the fact that this gas is, is actually flared gas at the moment or, or not flared, unfortunately, in some cases, it seemed like all this stuff just kind of came together. But what I'm curious about is, you, you know, you guys have been stressing that um, they don't have the throughput yet, the ability in, in the Caucasus and Turkey. But um, this was certainly something that the planners had considered. I mean, TANAP is supposed to 
increase to 60 billion BCM a year capacity. You know, I mean, how far behind are this, considering that they, they had to have known, even in the days of the when they were doing the Trans-Caspian Pipeline, that there uh, could come a time when they were going to need a lot of capacity to get through the Caucasus and a lot to get through Turkey. Can I answer that? Sure. The first thing is that the biggest customer for this gas will be Azerbaijan itself. Mm. Azerbaijan is short of gas domestically because it is contracted to sell almost all of the gas from the giant Shah Deniz gas field abroad, namely to Turkey and, and to countries in, in Europe. So the issue there is that as their industry expands and as they have to deal with, for instance, providing energy for Nagorno-Karabakh and the areas that they've recaptured in the recent fighting, they need more gas. And here is gas on the doorstep. Now, Azerbaijan still has a whole lot of gas fields, and these were all expected to be the source of gas for an expansion of the Southern Gas Corridor. But it will take years to bring those gas fields online, whereas this is gas that can be made available as soon as a connection is in place. It cuts everything out very, very quickly. So in that sense, this is a very timely project from an Azerbaijani perspective. As regards the problem of constraints, at the moment you have close to the maximum amount of gas that could go through the existing pipeline, and I'm talking about one, one small stretch of perhaps a couple of hundred kilometers through the South Caucasus mountain, where you've got both volumes from the original Shaftini contract and volumes from the later Shaftini's contract heading to Turkey. That is a big problem because you can't really put much more than you've got going through it. There's not much spare capacity. You would actually need, if you wanted to have any big volume of Turkmen gas, you'd need to build another new gas line through the Caucasus, as well as expanding capacities further down the line. Also, Ambassador, feel free you to jump in here. I mean, what I was wondering about is, yeah, it looks like well worked out plan. And as John was talking about, you know, the even you already have a market in mind for this. And also, it looks like some feasibility studies has been done, although I have seen on Eurasia Net article that feasibility studies is still pending or continues. If there's any thought you would like to share with us, uh, please do. But what I'm wondering about is, I mean, this well worked out plan, is it still your thoughts or it's been already shared between the parties like Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan and they are also on board with it? Dealing with the feasibility studies first, there were two feasibility studies done for large capacity pipelines done previously, one in 1999 and one in 2008, both of them funded by the U.S. government. Uh, so they're in the public domain and we've obtained copies of them. They indicate there are no technical problems to putting an undersea pipeline for delivery of natural gas. Uh, and and we have yet to do a feasibility study for this specific project. Uh, we need to do that because we need to look at uh, both the technical feasibility, a refresh of that. We need to look at commercial feasibility. And of course, we need to assess the environmental risks. So three prongs on a future feasibility study. Coming to the question of, of who is on board, uh, obviously we have been in dialogue with uh, all of the authorities that you mentioned, with the Turkmen, with the Azerbaijanis, particularly with Sokar. I've communicated with uh, some of the owners of the platforms in the Caspian. Uh, everybody thinks it's a great idea. Uh, everybody thinks it is something that needs to be pursued. Everybody is waiting for somebody else to make the first move. And uh, that's what we're trying to do as a startup is to be that catalyst that gets people to make the first move. So where that first move will come from? I mean, what is that and where it will come from? Uh, raising the money for the feasibility studies. That is a question where the money will come from. That's right. Any, any thoughts, any sources that you, you have been able to pinpoint so far? We have lots of thoughts and lots of uh, sources, Mohammed, that we're talking to, but that's not something I can go into in detail. So from this point of view, Ambassador or uh, John, uh, so what framework are we thinking about in terms of the uh, completion of this project from start to end? What are the dates you are looking at? 
we can't look at any specific date hmm. because until you've got the both the political approval from the Turkmen and the Azerbaijani authorities and you have got the finance arranged, you can't start practical work. You can do the feasibility study. But from a date on which we've got that go-ahead, then we could do the project and deliver actual transmission of gas within two years. It's not a complicated project. It's a very simple, straightforward one. Think of it more in terms of what it is like when you have one field and you simply connect a nearby field to it. This is the kind of thing that is done routinely by energy companies around the world all the time without anybody noticing. The only difference here is that it's connecting a field that is in a platform in one country to a platform in another. Can I just jump in here, Mohammed? Yep, yep, go ahead. And I mean, I think that, you know, what John just said is the strength of the project, but also it, its main obstacle, because these are not countries that have commercialized energy relationships yet. So my question for both John and the ambassador is that Bruce before outlined the change in the market, you know, within which this program will will eventually be operationalized. Are you aware or do you envisage any change in the political settings of one or, or both countries that will make you think that this can happen? Because Turkmenistan has not changed energy policy in 30 years. So what kind of context, political settings you, you, you see beneficial to your project? Well, I think the, uh, the major change was the signing of the memorandum on joint exploitation of the Dostluk oil field, which once that was done, we heard the leadership of SOCAR come out and say very directly that this is a precursor to other projects, including perhaps a connector gas pipeline. So I think the the politics changed dramatically once the Dostluk memorandum was signed and the fact that SOCAR has linked the idea of a connector to that memorandum is a very clear signal. John, do you want to add a comment? Just to say that when we started the project, we were in an era in which we had had four or five years of Azerbaijani efforts to try to prise open the door with Turkmenistan for direct flows of gas one way or another. Ravnag Abdullayev, the head of SOCAR, visited Ashgabat regularly, and there were talks in Baku as well. Nothing came of them. And when we started the project, we were still in that frame of mind. Dostluk took us by surprise. But of course, it's a tremendous help. We were thinking logically this was a sensible project, and maybe simply because it was a relatively small project, we might be able to get it off the ground. As soon as the Dostluk memorandum was agreed, we realized we might be able to do this with the active help of Azerbaijani and Turkmen authorities. We have managed to present the project to the Turkmen's and we have informed Sokar and the Azerbaijani authorities all along the way. So we are much better placed now than we were when we started uh, towards the end of last year, beginning of this year. Bruce, any final thoughts on this specific project that uh, otherwise we will move on to some of the regional perspective on this? Yeah, you know, it's just the, this, the perennial problems that have been with this pipeline. One, you know, Iran and Russia and what, um, you know, uh, that, how that's what, keep yeah, them that's, that, that's, some, that's something that I was about to come. Yeah, we will certainly we'll then, talk then about that. Then let me second part of my question. A lot of people say that the Turkmen government's been real difficult to deal with when it comes to trying to arrange these, these kind of projects. You know, Sokar, for instance, invested its own money into NAP. The Turkmen government, you know, there's there's various reports about how much money they have or, or might not have or what might or might not be in other banks. But, you know, is there any hint that the Turkmen government is planning on uh, modifying, altering, changing some of its policies and possibly actually contributing to projects that it ultimately mm-hmm. will benefit from, mm-hmm. uh, in this case, your project? Very interesting. Well, Bruce, I think you have to uh, bear in mind that uh, Turkmenistan's policy with regard to gas sales has always been that the gas, title to the gas uh, is transferred at the border. Yeah. So anything that leaves Turkmen waters is automatically, the title is transferred, and any infrastructure outside Turkmenistan is the responsibility of the purchaser. Mm -hmm. So the way this proposal, this project is structured, It requires no investment from Turkmenistan, in fact. 
and it merely requires an agreement with Turkmenistan that it will uh, agree to provide the uh, the gas and and will authorize that. So in that regard, uh, that that obstacle doesn't really exist. It just seems kind of strange because I know we're not talking about Tabi, but Turkmen gas has been much more active in in Tabi, for instance, out of maybe out of necessity. But you, you don't see that they're interested at all in, in the project after it leaves the Turkmen shores, uh, if it's a Trans-Caspian? Not if uh, past is prologue, Bruce. If past uh, practice and past policy continues to prevail, that's how we would anticipate it moving forward. TAPI is a special case, I think. It is unusual to see that Turkmenistan is actually laying pipe in Afghanistan and has put together the leadership of the uh, TAPI Pipeline Company Consortium. But that said, I, I, I think TAPI cannot be used as a model to apply to other similar projects. I think the point you can add there is that since Azerbaijan is going to be the initial customer and quite conceivably for a while the only customer, this will be a straightforward Turkmen Azerbaijani negotiation with regard to the actual gas sale. Mm. All we are doing is providing the infrastructure for the transmission of that gas for which a fee will have to be charged. Mm. That kind of raises another question, John. I mean, in case, still uh, with, with lots of caveat here, in case if this uh, goes ahead, this project, the way you are describing it, whether this is going to be kind of formula for future expansion of any sort of a Transcaspian pipeline with larger gas being exported from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan and maybe onward to Europe. Do you see that happening? Not in that immediate sense. This pipeline will have the capacity, we think, and of course the feasibility study is required to prove this point, of around 10 to 12 BCM. Anything greater than that cannot be handled at either the production end or at the distribution end from the Azerbaijani offshore facilities onshore without considerable further expense and expansion, not even expansion of existing infrastructure, but the laying of and the preparation of completely new infrastructure. Mm. Well, there... we, our whole purpose is to use what is there already to the maximum point. Anything after that, in effect, is a separate project. Mm. I was just wondering, in case if this happens, whether this is going to provide a base for new new pipelines to be launched in Caspian Sea, taking gas from Turkmenistan to onward to Azerbaijan and others. Perhaps that, that's something that we have to wait and see. So regardless of the length, size, and scope of the project, you know, it needs to pass through, through some parts of Caspian Sea, which brings up concerns about the environmental question, which had been at the center of Russian and Iranian opposition to any such plan. So what is going to happen with that concern? It looks like from uh, our experts' comments that Azeri and Turkmen side seems to be on board with that plan, but where are Russians and Iranians stands uh, on this project? So um, let's talk a little bit about that. And also, we would like to spare some time to, to look into details of recent talks on the, on the TAPI pipeline First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis podcast, I'm joined by Ambassador Alan Mustard, a former U.S. Ambassador to Turkmenistan, John Roberts, a renowned expert uh, on energy resources around the Caspian Sea, Dr. Luca Anchesti, Chair of Central Asia Studies at the Glasgow University, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Free 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 the Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Wazi. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Free 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 the Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing the new plan that seeks support Turkmen gas through the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan. So where we start? Uh, yeah, let me ask this first. Um, so was there any initial reaction by Russians and Iranians on this on this idea? Nothing from the Iranians that I know of. I think the most interesting thing about Iran recently is that they have been having talks with the Azerbaijanis about common development on disputed fields in the south of the Caspian. So that's a very positive development. That's showing Iran wants to cooperate in regional energy development. One point you can make about the Russians is, of course, that Russia and Kazakhstan cooperate on development in the northern Caspian 
which actually includes pipelines that span the uh, Kazakh-Russian boundary. So there is a precedent for this. But I think perhaps the biggest point that you make is the general one about the environment. We have now got literally hundreds of thousands of kilometers of line laid in the Caspian. These are lines that take the oil and the gas from fields, often 100 or 200 miles out, back to shore. And they've been laid consistently for the last 40 or so years, and they are consistently being laid new ones almost every day. The point is you've got to make sure that the quality of the line is good. There's no particularly technical problem in connecting up the two offshore platforms that we're considering doing. And lastly, with regard to one specific thing, the fact that this is the Caviar Sea, one perhaps ought to note that the, one of the very few studies on caviar in the area show that the people who have the best reputation for handling sturgeon are the Iranians. They're the ones who have been keeping the fishing down and looking after their sector of the sea best. So I would hope that Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan will learn and apply proper environmental standards. We certainly would on this project. What I'm wondering is like, you know, the types of the precedent you that you are talking about, John. Yes, they were there for a long time. But whenever a new discussion would start about launching any sort of Trans-Caspian pipeline, Russians and Iranian would bring up concerns about the environmental question, even though they have already launched sort of pipeline. There is already a precedent, but they would bring up this issue. Is it going to suddenly disappear from their agenda? Well, Mohammed, uh, let's remember the words of Karl Marx that politics is concentrated economics. And I think we can boil it down to that, that in reality, Russian and Iranian objections will be based on uh, concern about competition from Turkmen gas that would compete with Iranian and Russian gas. So, uh, first of all, on the environmental issue uh, specifically, we do plan to do extensive feasibility studies that will indicate what needs to be done to mitigate any risks. Uh, And of course, anytime you put a pipeline under the sea, you face risks, you have to mitigate them. And as John said, you have to ensure that you have uh, sufficient quality in your pipe and in your installation that you're not going to face undue risks. But coming back to the economic question, First of all, we're talking about a relatively small amount of gas that that can't possibly compete seriously with the large deliveries of Iranian and Russian gas that are envisioned for shipping to the West. And second of all, if you look at the customer base that we envisioned for this gas, it is basically the South Caucasus, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, and maybe a small amount going on to Turkey, as, as John said, about 2 billion cubic meters at the most. Uh, Whereas if you look at uh, Russian and Iranian ambitions, they are for much larger quantities going much farther west. So I don't see that in reality there's an economic competition here. That removes that argument and the environmental issues. As John pointed out, there are already thousands of kilometers of pipe under the Caspian Sea. Adding another 78 kilometers is uh, not going to be a tipping point in any any sense of the word. Mm-hmm. One would hope so. Um, can Bruce, yeah. can I get one in real quick? I'm also wondering... Um, Ambassador Mustard or John, um, your thoughts about, you know, there's reached another swap agreement. Turkmen gas goes to Iran. Iran provides like amount of gas to Azerbaijan. They've been mm-hmm. doing this for, for a while, but much, for like about a billion cubic meters. And, and Azerbaijan's been using it to top off its underground storage tanks and then sell the gas later. Now they're up to two billion. Do you see that kind of deal as representing any kind of a competition to you? I mean, in theory, they could they could boost the amounts mm-hmm. that they're they're transferring far above two billion cubic meters. You know, is that do you guys see that as competition to your project? Actually, we see it as a positive development mm-hmm. that helps uh, smooth the pathway for our project. The, the fact that the Turkmen, the Azerbaijanis and the Iranians are talking and, and have worked out a deal that's actually pumping gas. The, the quantity involved is not large. It's two billion cubic meters. We know the original capacities when constructed of the pipelines in question. One of them is 10 billion cubic meters. One of them is 8 billion cubic meters. But we don't know what their current capacities are. One of those pipelines is 50 years old, was commissioned by the Shah of Iran and uh, 
the prime minister of, of the Soviet Union, Alexei Kosygin. So uh, we don't know the condition of those pipelines, if that is going to go up, but we certainly don't view it as a, as a threat. John, over to you. I think the other point is that uh, the swaps arrangements have been for, around for quite a while because essentially Azerbaijan needs to get gas into its exclave at Nakhchivan and the Iranians have been doing that. Part of this new swap is an extension of that swap agreement. So I tend to think that there will be a little gas coming north from Astara on the Iranian-Azerbaijani border, but not that much. And it's not the 5 BCM that one needs for Azerbaijan. And the reason for that is that there is limited transmission capacity in northern Iran. There are some small pipelines that come across northern Iran. There is the Kopaji Korkui pipeline that brings gas down from Turkmen fields near the Caspian. But Essentially, they have been used traditionally to provide gas for northeastern Iran, and northeastern Iran still needs gas. So my guess is that this precursor is best seen, at least one element of it, as a precursor for resumption of Turkmen gas deliveries to northeast Iran, which is an area that the Iranians themselves find difficult to serve with their own gas resources. Bruce, I hope uh, the answer satisfied your question. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I was just wondering if you, I was glad to hear you say that that actually kind of benefited the idea of your project that they were there was this level of cooperation and and uh, if you thought that they could actually mm. boost their two billion cubic meters to something far greater which seems like they cannot with the existing infrastructure so mm. um, thank you very much okay on on this project uh, dr luca uh, still you got uh, one more opportunity to raise any question you might have or any points that you would like to add in the, the final the kind of thing that I would like to ask uh, is before we move on to another uh, aspect of our conversation. So the, the project is there, the idea is there, and you already have some bases in terms of the feasibility studies. So how soon we will see and where we should look into or keep our eyes on in terms of the next step on this project? What will be the next step and when we should expect that? Raising money. Yeah. I think there's another step, Hmm. a really positive, some kind of positive statement from the Turkmen authorities. Hmm. They know about the project, what we want to hear, what their their own views are. And the Turkmen so far have not made, said anything officially about it, although we have had contacts from Turkmen media asking about it. And of course, Turkmen media operate within a sort of semi-official hmm. environment. But what what do you make of it, uh, John? That Turkmen are officially not coming up and confirming or committing to it? Oh, traditional Turkmen caution. I mean, and the Turkmen are always right and careful to be cautious. The question is that they, at some point, they have to make a decision as to whether or not to invest time and effort on the project. And I think that that may become slightly easier now that there is one clear source of authority for the whole of the oil and gas sector in Turkmenistan, and that is, of course, the Deputy Prime Minister, Sadar Bedi Bahamadov. Right, right. Um, uh, any final thought, uh, Dr. Luca? No, I I think that there are quite a few um, interesting points. I mean, there is continuity, you know, in the sense that Turkmenistan has done this kind of short flung small gas deal for 30 years now as John was mentioning about Iran so they have an established practice for this but also there is this change because they are trying to opening up uh, new lines to export to, to export to get some Turkmen gas westwards to me this is interesting because it indicates that there has been some well they studied what what went on for 30 years and of course, I am notoriously pessimistic when it comes to Turkmenistan because I don't really see this elite having the political will and the intention to change. But this seems to be a, a rather feasible, uh, listening f- from what John and, and the ambassador are saying. Mm-hmm. What I remain skeptical about is the Turkmen side of things. I'm not an expert on Azer- in Azerbaijan, so I really don't, I'm not going to comment on it. But if there is a new economic 
context and there has been a new transcaspian context because now Turkmen and Azerbaijan do interact with each other. I still think that the Turkmen government, Turkmen gas, and now even Nasser Darbedi Mohamedov in charge do not have the incentives to make new deals and they probably want to keep things as they are. I don't wish that to happen, of course, mm. but you know, I guess that mm. if we have the same episode, the same five people in a couple of years, I'd be very happy to be told I was wrong. But the context is something which took me some political context, especially in this late, thoroughly depressing Berti Mohamedov here. I know when we are going towards some kind of elite change without having a regime mm-hmm. change for an authoritarian system in which energy policy is so important, mm-hmm. I do not see the context from genuine energy policy making happening. Again, I, I, very, don't, I don't think it needs change in energy policy as such. This is the point about our project. I think what you've got is a rather tricky situation that Turkmenistan has to navigate anyway. One are the persistent questions concerning the TAPI project because of problems beyond their control, namely concerning the isolation of Afghanistan under Taliban rule. But you've also got the fact that their biggest potential exporter, and it will remain their biggest export market, is China. But to expand that market requires very hefty investment in developing Galkanish. And from what we've seen about the cost of the wells that the Chinese are developing there, it's very expensive indeed. Mm. Whereas with the project that we are proposing, it uses existing gas that is flared or that is simply not being produced, but wasted or pumped in back into the, uh, into the earth because it comes in the form of gas that is being produced, not simply by Petronas in the center of the Caspian, mm. but by other companies, by Dragon Oil. Mm. And indeed, perhaps one could bring in the nearby onshore Burren field. Mm. But we're talking about existing gas developments we're not talking about the need mm. to drill new wells. Mm. No, I, I totally understand that, John, and I appreciate for you to making the point again. It seemed to me that your strategy of offering the Turkmen a low hanging fruit, it's kind, it makes sense, but I still do not, and here maybe Bruce can, can come in, because I discussed this in person with him many times, I still do not see this government having, this regime in Turkmenistan, having a coherent energy policy. Too many times we said that's what they should do, that's what they should do, they never did it. You and the ambassador, you and the ambassador have, did, have outlined a fairly rational context. I don't think that they're known to, to, to be working rationally. There is always calculation, there is always power play, there is always corruption behind what they do. And, you know, maybe, again, I'll be very happy to be told that I was wrong, but I have more than one doubt about this. Now, Dr. Luca, I am also really cautious to say anything that Turkmenistan would certainly do this or do that. And also, again, sort of John's comment added into my confusion there a little bit more in terms of, you know, with all this rational reason, this pipeline is very beneficial for Turkmenistan at a time when it, the economy needs really some energy and some fuel but still they are not publicly coming in saying anything about it. This is not a good sign. But in the meantime, while they are not talking about this one, they are engaging to the Taliban and talking to them in terms of, you know, Rashid Meredov was in, in Kabul and Taliban delegation was in Ashgabat, clearly talking about the prospect of the Tapi pipeline, why that is happening and what they are talking about. Bruce, uh, do you like to briefly uh, talk about this? And then um, we would like to slowly conclude the conversation with some additional thoughts on that. This has always been on the table. This is one of the few examples where Turkmenistan's policy of neutrality really pays off for them is that the regime in Afghanistan doesn't matter. It, you know, and they, they've pretty much made that clear that mm. they want a business relationship. And this is their, their big business project. You know, and it's something that, that Afghanistan needs and it's something that Pakistan needs and something that India would benefit, I suppose, from, too. If they're still on board, I don't know anymore. You know, the, the problem with this, they might have more stability. We'll have to see. It's still too early to say. When they first came up with this in the late 90s, they, that was probably would have been the best time to build it. Uh, ever since then, it's been a big question. I, I think there's still some questions about that. But the bigger question is investment. You know, the Taliban are under sanctions. And uh, what major financial organization or company are, is going to sink a lot of money 
into a project like that with all the unanswered questions that are surrounding that, you know, and in the face of potential repercussions for getting involved in a project that helps a group that's still branded as a, as a terrorist group by most countries of the world. Yeah. Um, obviously, we have spoken about with all the rationales, John, about the, the, the project that you guys are putting forward, um, which makes sense. And there is no cost to Turkmenistan and there is no need for additional wills to be discovered or anything like that. Only thing that Turkmenistan needs to do is say yes and let's do it, uh, which is not happening. But in the meantime, they are talking to Taliban and perhaps there are investments involved on Turkmenistan's side to build gas pipelines within its territory. And perhaps the discussion about is parts of the pipeline to be financed by Turkmenistan in Afghanistan. And, and do you see any prospect Turkmen gas going through Afghanistan to Pakistan and Afghanistan? Do you see any opening there at this moment? I think a certain amount of Turkmen gas will go to Afghanistan, but purely for use in northern Afghanistan and in the areas that can be served directly. Because they the Turkmen are already providing electricity and they've got a little railway that mm. goes over that way too. They are wanting to be good neighbors to whoever is ruling in Kabul. But developing a pipeline across the whole of Turkmenistan and delivering gas through it, that's a different matter, yeah. both for financial reasons, as we mentioned, who's going to finance it yeah. during a time of sanctions, and for practical security reasons. Afghanistan may have the Taliban as rulers in Kabul, but it has still got to deal with ISIS-K, who are causing almost as much chaos in Afghanistan as we used to consider the Taliban was causing. So there's that problem. But the other thing I think is quite quite important, which is things take time. We've always said things take time in Turkmenistan. And we have had, during the course of this year, a series of energy reshuffles. And yes, energy reshuffles are a near constant in Turkmenistan. But in the last few months, it has become clear that one person is now in charge of the country's energy policy. And that person happens to be the son of the president. This, I think, means as and when it he can take time from TAPI to look at our project, then one would be looking to get an answer. I am not surprised we haven't had one so far, not at all. But I would think that in the next few months, this will come very much to his attention. Mm. Okay, any other thoughts? Of, yeah, who's that? No, I think John uh, summed it up quite well. And I agree with Bruce, the major obstacle to Tappy at this point is going to be raising money because uh, I don't know of anybody who is going to want to invest in a pipeline that goes across okay. Taliban-held Afghanistan. Dr. Luca, any final thoughts on that? And otherwise, we are going to wrap the conversation. No, I, I think that Tappy was, was never going to happen even before the Taliban took power. I wrote about that. I, did a, I had a research project on it. So, I mean, but I could see that John's point, I think that's something which I never considered, the fact that if you reduce the ambition of the scope of Tapia, you make it a, a smallish pipeline between Turkmenistan and Northern Afghanistan, and then open up a small westward route, like the one that the ambassador and John yeah. are proposing. Yeah. Well, that's sort to be something more substantial in terms of diversification of energy. Yeah of energy exports. Yeah, yeah. It could be something that could ensure some kind of economic recovery yeah, yeah. for the Turkmen government. Yeah. We'll see, again, Serdar uh, Mohamedov, I am not able still to understand what kind of leader is going to be. Probably no one does, maybe the, the internal people know, of yeah, course, more yeah, than me, yeah. but this kind of diversification happening at the same time, a different route, is not what they're done confidently. Yeah. So we'll see what happens eventually. Yeah. But, you know, we need to be cautious. Yeah. Yes. I, I guess, you know, we, we really need to end the conversation here. I guess, the John, earlier, what you were referring to, Turkmen gas potentially going or going to northern Afghanistan. I guess you were referring to those uh, gas shipments through trucks and things like that, or you are envisioning something, a pipeline being built between northern Afghanistan. The Turkmen, of course, have uh, said that they've completed the pipeline that connects up to the border, mm. and they appear to be doing some kind of work within Afghanistan itself. I think we would be talking about some limited pipeline sales into mm. Afghanistan, but I wouldn't like mm. to put either the locations mm. or yeah. the numbers mm. out, because I think this is going to be very much a work mm. in progress 
that will be determined by all sorts of purely local factors. And, and maybe that's the last point I make about our project. Yes. Our project has some regional significance, but it really has virtually no global significance other than psychological. It's Muhammad, if I, if I may, I'm sorry, John. Well, not it. Ambassador? Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to point out that the, the, the Turkmen have long been delivering uh, liquefied petroleum gas by truck to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That uh, has been going on. That will continue. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're actually shipping some in by rail since the rail connections were put in. They're talking about a pipeline to Herat mm -hmm. as phase one uh, with a capacity of 8 billion cubic meters per year because they would not have full compression on it. They would basically be using a minimal compression on the Turkmen side of the border and no compressors on the, the Afghan side of the border. So that might happen, but uh, that still is off in the future just because of the lack of financing. Mm. Right, right. Okay, um, you know, the one well, other destination that Turkmenistan is selling its gas in, perhaps the, the major one, at this moment, the only one, maybe, largely, China. Is there anything, Bruce, you would like to bring in, in terms of the how it is going? Is there any new development in that? Or with that, we are going to conclude the conversation. Oh, well, you know, only, the only thing I saw that was moving on that was, you know, China's uh, relations with other countries are starting to fall apart a little bit. I mean, they have problems with Australia, for instance, and, and they were getting mm -hmm. some, uh, it must have been LNG from, from Australia, and I've heard, I heard they're going to have problems with that, and they, they've taken another look at Line D from Turkmenistan, which has been suspended for years and years now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if China loses more partners for if they decide for political reasons they don't want to deal with mm -hmm. people to certain individuals to get gas, would that lead Beijing to renew its interest in Line D and get that built as fast as possible, uh, which would save Turkmenistan and probably also allow Turkmenistan to put off decisions on other energy projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, I think we are going to end the conversation today. Yeah, the other export destination for uh, the Iran, it, that still remains closed, I guess, at this moment. No Turkmen gas going to Iran, right? They are talking about a possible resumption because they, they've been talking about clearing the debt mm. that exists between them. I think these are complicated issues, but it's interesting that both sides say that they're trying to sort them out. I think you may well get a resumption of Turkmen gas, particularly for two reasons. One, Northeast gas, Northeast Iran needs gas for domestic use. And secondly, although Iran is the holder of the world's biggest gas resources, in fact, it uses that gas enormously to improve by reinjection oil production. It also uses it for domestic industry. It is not primarily at this stage interested in using its gas for export unless it can somehow acquire LNG technology and with U.S. sanctions, that has so far proved impossible. You know, we are talking about this so many different directions, like China is sucking as much as gas it can from Turkmenistan at the moment, and now you are talking about the new sort of a project that will ship some gas from, in case it happens, some gas from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan, and then, John, you are referring to a discussion on the Iran and Turkmenistan level, and then some gas might be headed to Afghanistan soon, at least to northern Afghanistan. Does Turkmenistan has that much of gas that's readily available to ship all those sites. Well, I think uh, if, if, if Line D is completed, that has a, an expected capacity of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, I think that's another 30 billion cubic meters per year, is it not? I don't think and, it's, I don't think it's, I don't think it's Line, I think it's more like 20, but I, I would have to check myself. Uh, it's, it seems think, to me that, that line, line, line D would almost double the capacity of the entire TransAsia gas network. The current current capacity is for Turkmenistan is 35. The, the total capacity of lines A, B, and C, as I recall, is 55, and, and the Turkmen quota is 35, and that this would add 30 billion cubic meters and go to a different part of China. And to produce another 30 billion uh, cubic meters of gas out of Galkanish would require a minimum investment probably of another $20 billion because you'd need two desulfurization plants at about $7.5 billion apiece, and then you would need probably... Uh, another few billion to, to drill more wells to, to produce that much extra gas. So they can complete line D and then they're going to have to figure out, okay, where does the gas come from? And we are also noting that we lack 
confirm information on the progress that the Turkmens have made in producing gas from Galkanish so far. China is supposed to be producing something like 30 CNPC, 30 BCM from Galkanish under service contracts. But we haven't seen the Chinese personnel in the kind of numbers required to do that. All we know is that there is to be some well drilling at a very expensive rate. But we have no idea what the outcome of that will be. Right, right. Yeah. I didn't expect that Turkmen gas is going to be so interesting conversation. We are already maybe more than one hour talking about Turkmen gas. But it was terrific conversation. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to conclude it here, but we will keep our eyes on in terms of your uh, plan, how it goes. And we will check back uh, soon on that. Thank you very much, Ambassador Alan Mustard, former U.S. Ambassador to Turkmenistan. John Roberts, a, an energy expert on uh, Caspian Energy Resource. Courses, and also Dr. Lukan Chischi, Chair of Central Asia Studies at the Glasgow University, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready for Free Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlog Owazi. Thank you very much, colleagues, for being available to, to participate in this conversation. And this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis Ready for Free Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. Until next week, bye-bye.